James Haywood. I work with Off to Class. I'm an English language teacher and we have uh, had a lot of experience. We have a lot of experience now with uh, creating content for use in the online environment. Uh, so that includes just sharing it on a laptop um, via video conferencing web uh, sites such as Zoom and Skype, which we're doing today, and also for people who are now using content on uh, interactive whiteboards, in particular within language institutes or the school system. So obviously, books, as wonderful as they are, are not quite cutting it in the 21st century. And so a lot of teachers are wanting to move away from, uh, you know, the, the old printed uh, uh, worksheets and really uh, the old printed books and move to something that is much more attractive for especially for the visual learner uh, of the 21st century. So I'm going to share my experience. Um, we've had enormous feedback on the content so over time over the years that we've been working on this uh, we think we know we know we know now uh, well what works for online teachers and that means across um, several thousand users that we have on the site, uh, students working in various cultures and in all kinds of environments. As I said, from uh, students who are using the content online uh, via video conference or within a school system. So it's important to think about how your content, if it's just for yourself or if you're going to be sharing it, how that content is actually going to be displayed and viewed importantly by the students. So one of the things, um, I'm first going to talk about is uh, I'll divide it first of all into the actual content that you can use online and then I'm going to go into the formatting. Uh, both are obviously integrated but it's important to separate them a little bit as well. So this is our, uh, the page that you're on now is actually our off to class teacher page. Obviously you probably won't be storing all of yours in, in this kind of format but no matter what you do, the first thing, the most important thing that you want to do when you start creating content, whether you're going to do this full time or once a week on Friday after school, you're going to try and make a lesson for next week. The important thing is set up a file naming system now. It's really important that you can find everything that you do after. So whether you give something a unique number or you file things by categories, one of the things that we've found with teachers over the years, the, the, even though they have a lot of experience creating great PowerPoints or great worksheets, is they often can't find quickly what they're looking for. So the number one thing is, is give everything you produce, everything you produce and that you want to use again, give it some kind of unique numbering. Um, <clears throat> Right, here you can see, I'm just going to explain very quickly. When I create content, I create both what the student's going to see, which is on the right, and I'm going to call that the classroom. And on the left, I always have teacher notes. The reason I keep those separate, uh, I'll explain to you, but it's mostly about not bombarding the student with extra information. And it's also about controlling the amount of information that the student sees at any one time. And that's really what you want to do. With online content, you really want to, the student to remain focused on a particular task. And this, of course, is the huge advantage that you have using digital content. When you have a, a textbook, you will often have four or five different exercises that might run from an introductory to a production activity. And obviously, if you're teaching multiple students or even a single student, the uh, attraction for a student is to move forward through the book. Um, when you have online content, the large advantage is you can really control the flow of information, which makes for a much better lesson. And it also means that people, including the teacher, everyone is focused on the same piece of information at the time. I always start with a bright title page. You, should, you don't always have to have a title, but I think an image is a very powerful way if you are teaching online in particular or you're waiting for the classroom to fill up, it's great to give the students an indication of what's going to come without giving them too much information. As you know, visuals are a great way to prompt discussion or even a question, and that's really a great way to start the lesson. So I highly recommend putting images in at the very beginning with nothing else. For the instances of this demonstration, I'll, I'll get rid of the teacher notes, but I will come back to them later. So this is essentially how our content looks. Uh, I've built bright content that's quite bright. Hopefully um, it appeals to both children and adults or teenagers and above. 
uh, that's the that's the market that I particularly build for and nice and big so um, the next thing you need to do is you need to build yourself a template so whether you choose Prezi or PowerPoint or another system you need to be aware of the time constraints that you have as a teacher and be realistic about the amount of time that you have to learn uh, a, a, a new software program um, or an application. So I build in PowerPoint mostly because I had previous experience with it. And in order to write the amount of content that I want, I was realistic about it. Prezi is great, of course, but it does require uh, perhaps a higher level of knowledge and a little bit more patience. But like anything, there are people who have different preferences. Uh, mine is PowerPoint because it serves the purposes that I need. So once you've decided on uh, the, the system, that, sorry, the application that you're going to use, mine's PowerPoint, you need to set up a template. And I very much advise you to have a template, and within that template, you can have slides that um, are particular that they can you can reuse in different lessons as you go. So that each time you're creating a slide, you're picking from a category of slides that you already have. So, for example, title page, very easy. Another kind of category that you might have is like a guided discovery or a question prompt. So here I always have a slide that has a very quick um, uh, instruction at the top, um, an explanation, and then a couple of questions. Always an image on almost every slide. You will also have, this is from one of our uh, reading activities. Also, of course, grammar explanations are vital. Uh, these are probably the most complicated slides or the most time-consuming slides that you will produce But you're probably already going to start noticing that in every slide I have a title at the top of the slide and it's always in the largest font and always quite short So here's an example again fairly bright no image on this one as it's a simple grammar explanation um, but Grammar explanation is another type of slide that you want to have into the template. Another slide that I have is vocabulary. Obviously, this will have a large number of images, but a simple matching activity, or perhaps you may have definitions that are matched to uh, a word. This is another style that you can use over and over again. Um, and then you will have the task activity. So once perhaps you've done some of the uh, pre-production things, you will actually start getting into the tasks and exercises. Gap fill, whether you like them or hate them, I still think they're very relevant at certain levels of learning, so always have a gap fill. Uh, you can obviously move the information around as you want and perhaps even put the uh, words that will need to be used at the bottom or on the side, but I think a gap fill activity is, is quite important. Um, then I've also got for reading activities here a slide that uses the text and then on the left hand side you have the glossary um, I sometimes use images there to explain what's going on in the text also um, after that excuse me okay so that's a, an idea of the type of slides uh, that you will need now the next thing is how much information can you display here is where I suggest that you actually keep your teacher notes separate from what you want the student to be focused on. It's important as a teacher that you are able to prompt yourself, but if you're designing content for other people to use, you will need to think quite carefully around what other people might use to get your slide to work for them. And I find that teacher notes are really good because you can update those as you use the lesson yourself without the student having access to them. Here in our system, you'll see that they're joined together. But for example, if you have two separate PowerPoints that you can you know, display one on your iPad and one on your whiteboard or however you want to do it, you can actually be updating your teacher notes as you go along and they will always remain fresh. And this is important because you do want to, the student to be focused on a task but not reading everything that you're doing because it gives everything away. You want to make sure that these lessons that you create are teacher-led lessons and that they actually add value to you, your job as the teacher. If all of the information is provided on the slide, 
the student can more or less work through by his or herself. So I would keep my teacher notes separate, especially if you're using them, as I said, in collaboration uh, with other teachers. Um, as I said, one of the advantages that you have over books is the flow of information. And so when you're creating the content, think about that where you can really pull out a lot of the instructions and you can just put a very simple task at the, at the top. Here we've got a question prompt and then extra questions that you can see on the left hand side that will add further if you need some more prompts for the student to talk or if they're having trouble perhaps understanding some of those questions, there are some alternatives for you um, that, and uh, as I said, it, it stops you from crowding everything on the uh, site, on, on the slides. Also in teacher notes, if you're teaching a specific cultural group, for example, you might find there in the teacher notes that you can place uh, something that might jog your memory about the way students, perhaps from a Chinese speaking background or an Italian speaking background, might deal with a specific piece of vocabulary or grammar on the screen. So again, teacher notes separate uh, are, are very valuable for storing that kind of information. Um, I'll just remind you as well about the formatting that you can use. I'm going to come back to another slide. And as I mentioned here, when you're putting the slides together, the look is actually provide consistency. What you are going to find is students become used to and, de and, and they develop a habit of seeing your content. And you can use that to your advantage because the students start to understand how to read the content that you're doing. So if you always have a very bold title up the top, what I would recommend is always either having um, an instruction up here or something that prompts almost a question. I tend to avoid questions that use words like try to do this or can you do this. If it's an instruction, I just say your turn, time for you to practice, time to practice or just a very quick indication of what's to be explained underneath. So I believe that a title is always important. Um, want, you want to keep it short and you want to keep it large. Underneath, you can start to break down that explanation. And I'm going to come to the lesson, for example, oh, excuse me, um, the phrasal verb ones, I'll just come here. So this is a lesson on phrasal verbs. There's an introduction and here, You've got, as I, as I mentioned, an instruction at the top. Everything's in the imperative. There's no question. It tells the student exactly what to do. And then it gives a further breakdown here. One of the good advantages of um, having a very clear instruction is those instructions can be also used in template and repeated time and time again. It's important, especially at lower levels, not to make the instruction uh, too complicated. And if you are using the same words over and over, and what we normally do is whether it's underline or circle or highlight or find, the vocabulary is limited. So keep it as simple as possible and repeat it as often as possible for the student. Underneath is the place to give a breakdown of that instruction. So here, the student's quite clear about what to do and to use the target language uh, in, in context, and then the exercises underneath. For each slide, when you're doing an exercise, I'll just go over, I would highly recommend, first of all, if you're going to use PowerPoint, I'm even going to tell you what works perfectly for me, is a font size of 38 in the title. Um, we found over our lessons that this works particularly well. Underneath, something around 26. And whatever you do under here, keep it between 24 and no smaller than 18. If your students are going to be working on iPads or on a laptop in particular, this is vital. Because once you go under 18, there is a tendency to crowd the slide with too much information. Numbers also are vital. Even when you have images on screen, you should always number images, even if you are, uh, or, or place letters on them, however you want to order them. It's 
really important because if a student, a student will often ask you a question about the text and it's very easy for them to say in picture A, number eight, rather than just if they haven't got the language to get out in the first place, they're going to struggle. So even with images, I tend to put A, B, C, D next to them, even if there is no exercise explicitly explained on the slide itself. So every every image I, I tend to do that for it, it works, it works quite well. Um, so with text sizes, I would do that. On an exercise, I would also limit the amount. Here you're limited by space, but I find the maximum number of exercises that I will place on any one slide is four to five. The reason for that is at lower levels, Repetition is exceptionally beneficial, I believe, when you're learning something like object pronouns or you're going through a grammar-based lesson such as the uh, past simple or you might be doing uh, past participles in present perfect. Repetition is, is a very good way for students to start to ingrain this before you do production type activities. However, you don't want to bombard them with a slide that has 15 exercises on it because it just simply looks too arduous and, and boring for them to do. So again, the idea with online content is really reduce it down to what you can. And then if you have to, you can do slides that look the same, but you can move through 12 activities on four slides. Even the changing of the slide allows for a break, asking a question, and it doesn't overwhelm the student uh, with content. If you are using large amounts of text, uh, for example, in a reading activity, uh, I'll just come here. This is one of our upper intermediate or perhaps even advanced uh, reading activities. I'll just show you quickly here. Uh, again, bright title page. We've got a slightly different template, which is brighter and more colorful. We did that specifically for reading activities because we found that obviously there's going to be more text. So a little introducing a little more color is important in the reading activities. But what I wanted to show you is as you come through to the writing here, I haven't gone under 18. And I also say while on 18, the maximum number of words on a slide should probably be around 120 to 130. Of course, that will depend on the level of your students. But again, for visibility across any device, um, again, if the students are accessing via an iPad, uh, internet, uh, sorry, the interactive whiteboards in a classroom, perhaps you can squeeze more on. But I think this is what we found to be the ideal amount of text at any one time. And it also importantly allows you to have other information on the screen. So that's what I would say about the uh, reading activity. If you do want to go for more than 120 words, I would certainly advise you to go into columns. If you have dialogues or a long piece of text, you can also go into columns, although I wouldn't use those in instructions and also at lower levels where students can actually start to move from left to right rather than top to bottom first. Uh, four to five exercises I mentioned. Um, vocabulary slide here as well. Using color is a very good way here, for example, of having a task-based activity where you just have a couple of colors on the screen and it's very clear what the student needs to do. There's actually no real instruction here, but it's very quick from prescribing something. The student will work out that it's actually a matching activity and there's really all of the information they need on the, the, the text, but nothing more. Again, if you are handing your content over to another teacher to use or maybe you're making it for multiple teachers. One really good thing about having notes is that you can put the answers in. So sometimes there is only one answer, as in a gap fill, uh, but in others, it is possible that there are alternate answers. And so you can either put in the exact answers or you can put in suggested answers or example answers. So uh, that's an example of teacher notes really giving you an advantage, especially when sharing the online content. 
if you are preparing content for students who, uh, sorry, if you are preparing content for teachers who have less experience or who are newly experienced, notes are very, very powerful for them to give them confidence in front of the student while still being focused at the same time on what the student is doing. Okay, there we go. Okay, going over to the idea of uh, colors, um, if you're not a designer by trade, and I certainly am not, uh, I find that monochromatic lessons are not a bad way to start. Um, you can, of course, pull uh, different um, color palettes from the internet, but one thing you need to be really careful about is if you use PowerPoint, which comes loaded with preset colors, you're fairly much guaranteed that if somebody works on a Mac, if you're working in collaboration, or on a PC, those colors will appear as the same. If you start putting in colors, you start using your own colors from the system, you might find that there are problems if different people are working on the file. So I tend to use a color, a preset color system, but what I do is I vary and mix up the transparency um, or the brightness of the colors within PowerPoint so that you can use the different shades um, and as you can see, most of the lessons we use are monochromatic, but they do tend to use the preset colors uh, in the system. Um, let me see, what else was I going to talk about? Images. Now, images are one of the most powerful things you can put in your online content. And of course, you need to be using, unless you have a lot of money, uh, a royalty-free source that allows you to not only use the images, but you can uh, modify them without any problem whatsoever. Uh, the site that I recommend, and I'll just bring it up here, is Pixabay. Um, it says there are around, okay, there's well over half a million slides available, and there's almost nothing that you, uh, I'm sure some of you are already familiar with it, um, but as soon as you type something in, you will get hundreds and hundreds of royalty-free images. You can also search, for example, if you were teaching uh, younger students, you might just want to use uh, vector graphics, uh, you know, that are brighter, more colorful, clip art style things. There's plenty of that. It's very easy to use. I'll just advise you that at the top, these are actually Shutterstock images. You can't download those ones, but there are simply hundreds of thousands for you to choose from. And images again in your text, explaining obviously of introducing vocabulary but if you have a reading text and you don't want to detract with a glossary you can often use images to explain the vocabulary that's within the sentence itself um, there are some drawbacks uh, if you need to use images for perhaps something like phrasal verbs or you might be needing to explain abstract uh, nouns or an, abs yeah, an abstract noun in English, it's not always easy uh, to, to find, I don't know, a picture that explains complexity or um, a, a, a picture that explains to get through with. But on the whole, uh, images are very, very important and we tend to use them also in our speaking activities. I'm just going to bring one of those up. So... Okay, so I'll just bring up a speaking activity. Again, they always start with a very big image, get people talking. And with our speaking activities, one of the great things is you can produce them at a faster pace than most of the other grammar-based lessons. However, the teacher notes, again, become very important because the more images you have on screen, and if you're going to share your content, the more questions you will want to have on the left-hand side so that teachers, especially newly uh, qualified or inexperienced teachers, or perhaps teachers who don't know the subject matter particularly well, will be able to uh, use, those, use those notes. Okay, so here's the, as you can see, all of these are royalty-free images, so it's a, Pixabay is a very powerful tool for bringing the on -kind, online content alive. Okay, so I think that's more or less all I wanted to go through, uh, covering the formatting and the content. 
Um, I'm just going to come back to our home page. You can see here, as I mentioned, it's very important for you as a teacher. And if you don't always have time to be working on the lessons and you're doing this maybe during the holidays or the days then where you don't have uh, marking to do, it's really important that you organize the entire thing into a library, particularly, again, if you're going to collaborate with other people. So as well as, as I said, mentioning up a file sharing system, I would give a unique number to every lesson that you ever do. And one thing I didn't mention is that on each of your lessons, the first page on the teacher note, I think it's also vital to put your objective. It doesn't have to be very long, but just put it so that if other people are looking for it, they can find in 10 seconds what the objective of, is of the lesson and what this lesson will cover. I sometimes also put vocabulary that will be covered in the lesson, but not for, not for all of the lessons. It depends, of course, the category to which uh, the lesson itself belongs. So that's what uh, I'd like to share with you today. Um, I don't know, Chris, uh, if I should, because your voc... Let me have a look. Um, maybe I'll hand it over to you again, Chris, and you can perhaps start answering some of the questions that have come through. Great. Okay, guys. Um, <clears throat> so I'd just like to point out that you can post your questions using the Q&A function, <clears throat> and we will take them up. Um, I had a good question that I've already answered by text um, from Toy. And um, he mentioned something about our um, classification. I'm just going to share my, my screen. And what Toy said is that he notices um, on off the class that some lessons are designed in somewhat of a series format. So specifically what he was pointing out to was um, if I open up our verbs category. This is our verb simple category. And as you can see, we have VS 3.1 is a present simple um, lesson. And then we have VS 3.2, 3.3, 3 3.4, and 3.5. And that numbering is actually, is, is intended to indicate that these form a kind of a, a sub series or a mini series. And, um, the idea here is that um, VS 3.1, for example, if I open up the teacher note for VS 3.1, and I can open up the front page of the teacher note, as James was mentioning, there's a primary objective. So the primary objective here is to look at the present simple positive form with regular verbs. And VS 3.2 would would start to look at some irregular verbs. VS 3.3 would start looking at the negative form, and the VS 3.4 would start looking at the question form, and so on. So if you had a student that had never been exposed to the present simple before, then naturally you would take that student through the present simple series one step at a time, starting with VS 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and so forth. But if you had a, it's also designed to be hop on, hop off. If you had a student that had, was, was exposed to the present simple, but wasn't, but wasn't getting the question form correct or was struggling with the question form of the present simple, you could jump directly to the question form. Um, and the way, the, the easy way of accessing the question form is you could actually type it into our search bar up here. So you could type in present simple, questions and there we go i can see that vs 3.4 focuses on the present simple question form so i could actually jump right into the present simple question form um, without having to go through the series in a chronological order of vs 3.1 3.2 3.3 and that was that was a great question from toy and uh thank, thanks for asking that that's that's wonderful and um, I'd just like to point out that, yes, you can ask us questions. They don't necessarily need to be, um, we're opening up this for you as participants here today. 
So they don't need to necessarily be about creating content. They can be about any aspect of online ESL teaching. Um, please fire away using, um, using the QA, QA form. Oh, okay. And then we've got another, um, <clears throat> another question about the name of the website where we can download various images. So there's a number of places where you can download images from royalty free. Um, one of them, one of them that you can answer, uh, sorry, that you can um, access that James was showing was Pixabay. And Pixabay, actually, I'm just going to go to Pixabay. Pixabay um, has a um, relatively extensive library of royalty-free images um, that you can download and use even for commercial purposes, such as developing your lesson plans for, for use on italki. And just as we wait for some more questions to come in, um, Toy actually had a secondary question about uh, off to class. And um, what he wanted to know was whether, you know, because as I mentioned, this, this is a, there's a huge amount of lesson plans here. So you have over, over 500 teacher-led ESL lessons here. And um, these, these are very much designed in a hop-on, hop-off style. So if you signed on to italki, potentially with a new student or even with an existing student, and it was clear that today your student wanted to talk about climate change. Well, you could type in climate change directly into our search bar and access our speaking activity on global warming right away, within one click. I can launch this lesson by clicking on the top. And right away, I'm in a lesson on global warming. <clears throat> and without even ever preparing this lesson plan or looking at this lesson plan before you're ready to teach your student wants to wants to talk about global warming you're ready to go you've got the front page of the teacher notes to coach you on how to teach this lesson but if you wanted a plan a systematic plan to teach your student if you didn't want to apply a hop on hop off approach for every time you were teaching your student you can actually send your student our placement tests and when you send your student our placement test, um, they will receive a 100-question grammar diagnostic. And when they answer those 100 questions, you'll get a gap analysis back. Um, and the gap analysis will actually show every question that your student got wrong or answered I don't know to on the placement test. I'm just going to open up my student Jonathan's gap analysis. And what actually, so every student, my, every question my student answered incorrectly, I actually have the lesson from which that learning point comes from. And we call this the individual learning plan. And you could actually use this as a structured approach to um, target lesson plans from our library to directly target the weaknesses um, in, your, in your student's ESL understanding. Um, I'm just gonna, as we wait for some more questions to come in, please post, uh, please post your questions using the, the QA function. Um, there was a mention of, um, can we all access off to class for free for a month? And absolutely. I'll just show you, um, if you go to off to class.com, I'm on off to class.com. I'm not logged in right now. Um, you, Every teacher can actually set up a free trial account for off to class. You get 30 days to try the lesson content and the homework, and then you have unlimited free use of our placement test in our games. Um, so you get a 30 day free trial for the lesson content and the homework, and you have unlimited free use of the placement test and the games, and you can actually set up a free trial account right here. It takes a couple clicks. Um, and you will then have your, your free trial will then be activated. Ah, we've got a good question um, from Osnur. Um, are the students allowed to reach the lesson content? 
So this is a very good point, Osner. Thanks, thanks for this question. Um, basically, as James mentioned, this content is designed to be teacher-led. So the reason for that is because James is a teacher. We, our team has a background in teachers and teaching, and we feel that it's extremely important for um, secondary language acquisition for the teacher to be at the center of the equation. We don't believe that there's many students that can learn a new language, that can learn English um, from self-study alone. So these lessons are designed to be teacher-led in the sense that they're not going to make too much. The, they're not going to make too much sense if the student was accessing these on on their own. They're designed for a teacher to bring the lesson alive. That being said, certain slides do stand alone. So, for example, in this conditionals lesson, certain slides require the teacher to bring it alive. This is designed to be an actual activity that you would that you would take up live with your student. You can use our pen feature to kind of work, work the activity live with your student while you're teaching on Skype or on Zoom or on Hangouts. But then certain slides do stand alone. So things like a grammar explanation, um, your student could access this as a reference and it would make sense to them if they've already been through the content with the teacher, it would make sense to them to come back and review this. And when you enroll students in an off-class classroom, we automatically send the lesson summary to the student after class. So your student will then log into off the class to complete homework, to track progress, to take placement tests, and we will automatically send a copy of the lesson summary to your student, which tends to be about five to eight of the key summary slides. And the important part is we send the slides that stand alone, that don't need the teacher there to bring them alive in a live session with your student as a reference for your students. I'm just going to take up Gael's question. Sorry, I'm just, just reading. I'm sorry, I'm just going to take that up. Um, Okay, Gael's asking about PowerPoint. I think James got, got, um, got to her by text, but in short, I think anybody with uh, basic computer skills has the ability to, to create PowerPoint slides. They might not be the most beautiful at the start, but there's some fundamentals in slide creation um, that if you can adopt those, um, I believe that even without a design background or a um, PowerPoint background, I believe you that 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 PowerPoint is easy enough to use, and if you follow best practices, that you, you can absolutely teach yourself to create to create decent looking slides. Um, Janine asks, "How do the students see the lesson? Does the student register on the site? Does the teacher share the screen?" That's a great question, Janine. Um, so we're actually designed to be used for online lessons through screen sharing. So just the way I'm sharing my screen with you now, um, I, let's pretend you guys are my students and I'm gonna launch a lesson. So I'm gonna launch diet and nutrition. And let's say I'm teaching my student Ben today. So I'm enrolling Ben into the classroom. And you are my student Ben. So Right now, you're able to see the content on your side of the Zoom classroom or the Skype classroom or the Google Hangouts classroom because I'm sharing my screen. But as we mentioned, you have in off the class, you have both the student content on the right, that's for the student to see, and the teacher notes on the left. That's only for the teacher to see. So obviously, you're going to want to hide the teacher notes from your student while being able to see them yourself. And the way you do that, it just takes a couple clicks. You just press this full screen button in the top right. That causes the teacher notes to pop up, make a little bit of space for the teacher notes. So now I'm ready to teach. I can see the teacher notes because I'm the teacher, 
but my students, you guys, cannot see the teacher notes. And I can draw on the screen in real time, adapt the content, bring it alive. I've also got a text tool. Uh, I've got a magnifying glass where I can focus my students' attention on different parts of the content using the magnifying glass. I've got a text tool I can write on the screen. So yeah, this is this is quite powerful for an online lesson. And now the reason, now the, the second part of, of Janine's question, um, the reason I enrolled my student Ben into the lesson is because at the end of the lesson, when I go to close the classroom, The student, the sorry, the system will ask me. So now we're at the end of the lesson. It's been a great session. And at the end of the lesson, when I go to close the classroom, because I registered my student Ben into the classroom, the system asks me if I want to send the homework to my student. And this is quite powerful. So each of these lessons come with an asynchronous uh, self-study activity that Ben will then log into OctaClass between lessons to both access his lesson summaries, and the lesson summary will automatically be sent to him, as well as to complete his homework. Um, so this is, this is uh, the basic functioning of how you'd use this on italki, whether you're using Skype, Hangouts, or whatever video conferencing system you're using for your, your italki. Um, Hugh, thanks for your question. Hugh's asking about uh, homework. Um, and what does it look like? So that's a great question, Hugh. Um, basic, so actually, you can, you can preview the homework in a number of places before sending it to your student. So each, as I mentioned, each of the 500, over 500 lessons on our um, system come with a set of homework. So right now, if I was to select, um, our listening activity on the past simple of to be. So I have three icons under here. I have one icon that will launch the lesson, another icon that will preview the lesson, and the third icon will actually preview you the, will show you a preview of the homework. So I'm gonna press that icon so I can show you what the homework looks like from LA20 past simple of to be. And because this is a listening activity, um, it actually has the recording from the lesson. And basically, we could play this recording. It would be the same recording of the lesson. And then we have some listening for very specific information questions. And here we have a, a, a gap fill exercise based on, on the same recording. So Hugh, it really, it really depends on, um, on the lesson that you're talking about. So for example, this is a advanced speaking activity, diet and nutrition. So if I preview that homework, the first page is multiple choice, and the second page, especially for pre-intermediate up, we always give a big opportunity for writing. So here you have um, a number of short answer questions that the student would answer by free text, and then we have a longer, a longer uh, pretext answer question um, with a suggested word count of about 100 words where the student has to write um, about the topic from their own perspective. But yeah, it, too, it really depends on the, um, on the lesson that you're talking about. Um, G asks, um, can the students use the tools on screen during the lesson? And then can they print off the screen lessons for review if they want? So as far as there, there's no printing feature here, we send everything automatically. So as I mentioned, um, we will send the lesson summary automatically to your student for review after class. So maybe what actually makes sense um, is that I show you what off to class looks like from the student perspective. So 
that you guys can get a, a kind of visualization of that. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here again. And I'm going to log into Opt Class now from a student's perspective. So again, I go to the same place, optclass.com, and your students will go to optclass.com, and this works from any internet connected device, so they don't need to use access to soft laptops, they can access this off, um, off their smartphones or their tablets. And this is what OptiClass looks like from the student's perspective. Um, obviously, you can see it's a very sim simplified view. Um, and then, so what you've basically got is any active homework assignments that you've assigned your student are at the top. Any homework assignments that your students have completed in the past are at the bottom. And any lesson summaries. So for every time you enrolled your student into a lesson, they actually get delivered a lesson summary down here at the bottom. So when I go back, I can actually see all the lesson summaries, all for every lesson that my student was ever enrolled in, I can see the lesson summary. And the lesson summary tends to be, um, this one's quite short because it's listening activity, but on a grammar exercise, it tends to be up to about seven or eight slides. Um, summarizing all the points, all the slides that do not require the teacher to be present to bring, to adapt the content and bring the content alive for the, for the student will be available um, for the student for review after class. And um, the lesson summary is also available from within the homework. So when your student is completing the homework, this is a listening activity homework, so again, it has recordings and your, student answer, ans your students answer very specific pieces of information based on the recordings, but they can also access the lesson summary from within the homework as a guide, as a reference for when they're completing the homework. I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen for a second and come back to the teacher page of off class. Yeah, GS, okay, so the, the homework loop is, is quite powerful on OptiClass. Um, it's not really sub the subject necessarily of this, um, of this webinar, but since there are no other questions, I'll, I'll go over that. So basically what happens is your students log into OptiClass, and, and so first of all, at the end of the, the live lesson that you're teaching your student, you assign the homework to your student, and they receive a notification by email that you've assigned them a piece of homework. They then log into OptiClass to complete the homework. Once they click submit to you, the teacher, you get a notification that um, homework has been submitted to you. And then you log into OptiClass, you go to your student management panel, click on one of your students, and you, um, you're actually able to review the homework. And when you review the homework, you're actually able to leave comments for your student and you're able to personalize um, the, the review that you give the, stu the student in what we call the homework classroom. So when I open up one of my homework assignments that my student has submitted to me, um, this is that S504 diet and nutrition. Basically, this is what we call the homework classroom. You've got your student's answers on the right, and the answer key on the left. So we make it quite easy for you if you want, especially as a one-on-one -on -one teacher, you can actually take up the homework um, for the first 10 minutes or so live of your next lesson with your student. And you're actually able to leave feedback for your students directly in our, in our homework classroom using uh, the feedback tools here. And you can leave comments for your students. And when you go and close the classroom, I'm just going to leave a comment to illustrate. You could say something to the effect of, um, of great, you know, I could leave something encouraging, like, great work, Emily, really coming along. 
I can underline this, italicize, bold, I can pick a different color, and I can save that. And now when your students log into off to class and review this completed homework, they'll both get a copy of the answer key and will be superimposed on their answers, plus they'll receive all your personalized feedback. So this is a really, really nice tool to kind of personalize the homework experience and it makes it really easy to, to deliver and review homework for you, the teacher. And you know, if you think about italki, um, there's obviously a lot of ESL teachers um, on italki competing for students and being able to offer both that your, your Skype, your live Skype lesson includes both the live component as well as homework that your students get to complete between classes is definitely a unique selling point um, that you can use to show that you, you add significant value if, if a teacher, if a student is gonna come and, and learn with you on italki. Uh, Osner is asking us how long it took us to prepare the lesson, the 500 uh, lessons. Uh, well, we're, we're currently have been at this for two and a half years and we've, we've got a lot more work to do. So, um, yeah. And Janine, um, during the 30, 30 day free trial, I didn't fully uh, understand your question, but I'll just go over the 30 day free trial. So during the 30 day free trial on off to class, which you can set up your free trial account on off um, during your 30 day free trial, you will have access to uh, about a quarter of our lesson library and you'll be able to add four different students to be able to log into off to class to complete their homework and review their lesson summaries. Um, so you'll have pretty good access to the product um, during your 30 day free trial and plenty of time uh, and student capacity to try us out with some of your students from, from italki. It should, should give you plenty of access. So if there are no more questions, yeah, so if there are no more questions, um, I think that was a, a great session and we're coming to the hour mark. And I'd like to thank you all for joining. One thing I'd like to point out is that we are recording today's session. So give us about 24 hours to get it online and I'll be emailing you all with a recording of today's session so you'll be able to, uh, to watch us over the weekend. So thank you very much. And um, I'll just mute my microphone so James can sign off. Thanks, guys, and we hope you enjoyed the session, and take care. Bye-bye.